Hi everyone. So this is the fourth video in a lecture series on exponential growth. And I've walked you through all of these great examples of how exponential growth is everywhere and describes, you know, bunny populations and fission, the stock market, you know, all of these exponential growth processes. And now I'm really excited to tell you kind of where this ends and that in practice, exponential growth doesn't actually really exist in any system forever. So even if you have a system that's really well modeled by exponential growth, eventually something is gonna stop your system from going exponentially because you know there's finite resources on Earth, there's finite resources in the solar system, in the galaxy, eventually you're gonna hit some limit where you can't keep growing exponentially, okay? So we had talked about um, you know doubling of populations. I, this is an example I actually cooked up this morning because uh, I think it's kind of a fun example. Is if you go back and count kind of your family tree and how many ancestors you have. So this is me. Uh, I had two parents, as most of us do, and my two parents each had two parents, and their two parents had two parents, and this kind of leads to a paradox. Um, I think a lot of kids have have figured this out pretty early that the logical progression of this doesn't really make sense. So if I double the amount of ancestors I have every, every generation I go back, very quickly, within about a thousand years, let's say that that's 50 generations, I will have quadrillions of ancestors. And that doesn't make sense. We don't think that there have been quadrillions of humans on Earth, okay? Uh, and so, there's a pretty simple solution to this, and that's basically that at some point, my ancestors were all kind of mixed up and we're all like, we are all, how do I wanna say this? At some point, every ancestor on every branch is not unique. These people become cousins at some point and maybe my third great grandfather was also my third great grand uncle on a different branch because they're the same person because family trees don't just branch forever. At some point, your ancestors will come back at multiple points, and although this grows exponentially, eventually it kind of um, can't grow anymore because there, there weren't that many people who existed. And this goes to show that basically everybody on planet Earth are cousins at some level back. We had to be, or else there would be quadrillions of people in our ancestor tree. Okay, so all of us are like 10th or 20th or 30th cousins, maybe 50th cousins uh, with one another. That's kind of a fun example of how exponential growth can't possibly go forever, okay? So if we go back to our bunny population, so we've seen you know, this kind of cutesy example of how two bunnies become four bunnies, four bunnies become eight bunnies, we know that they double and double and double but this can't go on forever, okay? So my neighborhood, my backyard, whatever, the, the environment where these bunnies live can't support infinity bunnies, and so eventually something is gonna cause this to stop growing. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about now are some examples of how exponential growth naturally does saturate at some point. So this was our differential equation for bunnies. It gave this nice exponential growth. Um, but if you have limited resources, like a limited planet Earth, or let's say a limited, you know, I've got bunnies in my backyard, but only so many of them can live because there's only so much food, only so much lettuce and carrots, you can modify the equation. So it's still the same basic part. You get this exponential growth, but there's this correction term that tells you uh, that there is a maximum carrying capacity in your neighborhood or on Earth so big X is the most bunnies that your environment can, can handle before some of them start to starve, okay? So big X, maybe it's a million bunnies, maybe it's a thousand bunnies, I don't know. In my case, I picked 40 bunnies, so big X is 40. That's as much as my backyard can handle. And so what you'll see is that as your population gets closer and closer to the maximum, this gets closer and closer to one, and your exponential growth gets multiplied by a number that gets closer and closer to zero. So it slows your exponential growth. So if I started with two bunnies, after one year, I'm still gonna get four bunnies. After two years, I'm still gonna have eight bunnies. But very quickly, I'm running out of resources and so this number is getting closer to zero and my rate of growth is decreasing. And it decreases more and more, faster and faster as I get to this carrying capacity 
uh, big X. And so you see that this is a very simple mechanism for my exponential growth to curtail and to eventually hit some, some maximum value. So this is sometimes called a sigmoidal function. Uh, this is called the logistic equation. It's super important in dynamical systems, in lots of systems. Um, there have actually been some great YouTube videos on the logistic equation uh, that I'll link to. Um, pretty sure Veritasium did a really, really nice one recently on this equation. Okay, So that's one way that exponential growth curtails in, uh, in population dynamics. Now, another way that exponential growth can curtail, I have the same bunnies uh, given by x. So x is my population of bunnies. Um, Xk plus 1 is my number of bunnies next year. R is my birth rate. What if I have wolves? What if there's some predator species? My wolves uh, are y. Okay, The population of wolves is given by y. And we know that wolves eat bunnies. And that's going to keep these bunnies from growing exponentially, because if I get more and more and more bunnies, I'm going to get more and more and more wolves that eat those bunnies. And eventually, I'm going to hit some kind of a, a balance point. And notice that this term here uh, is, is pretty interesting. It's nonlinear. And what this says is that the number of bunnies that get eaten is proportional to how many bunnies there are. If I have twice as many bunnies, probably twice as many are going to get eaten. But it's also proportional to how many wolves there are. If I have twice as many wolves, I'm going to eat twice as many bunnies. And so the rate at which wolves eat bunnies is proportional to x times y. And E is just a constant that tells you know, how fast, how, how uh, frequently wolves come in contact with bunnies and eat them. Okay, So this is going to balance out that exponential growth because the faster they grow, the more wolves are going to eat them. Now, of course, there is an equation for wolves too. So the number of wolves uh, is going to be, and the way we're going to do this is that um, the wolves are going to have a natural death rate. So if there's no bunnies, the wolves are just going to starve to death and they'll die eventually. But they're going to have new wolves. New wolves are going to be born when they eat enough bunnies. And again, they're going to have a birth rate that's proportional to how many bunnies they eat, and how many bunnies they eat is proportional to x times y. So this is not the right model. This is a very, very crude, simplistic model, but it illustrates kind of these population dynamics. This is called the Lotka Volterra model, and it's really useful as a toy model for population dynamics. So now let's start the system off. We're not just going to plot bunnies in time, we're going to plot bunnies and wolves in time. And I'm going to start off with 40 bunnies and 5 wolves. And I'm not going to have any carrying capacity, so the bunnies could go to infinity. Now, at, after one year, the bunnies are growing exponentially. Okay. After two years, they're still growing, but the number of wolves is growing because there's so many bunnies. Lots of wolves are being born because they're eating lots of bunnies. And notice that they've already started to slow down uh, the bunny growth. There's now a lot of bunnies, so there's going to be even more wolves the next year. But because there's so many wolves the next year, they're eating a lot of bunnies, so the bunny population is dropping precipitously. Now a lot of these wolves are going to starve because there's not enough bunnies. So now the wolves are starting to go down. There's still a lot of wolves, so they're eating a lot of bunnies. But now... Eventually, the, bunny, the wolf population dies off low enough that the bunnies start to go exponential again, and then they grow and grow, they hit their peak, there's a lot of wolves, and so on and so forth. And this repeats forever, okay? And you get this kind of oscillating ebb and flow of bunny and wolf populations where they oscillate out of phase with one another. Now here you can also write this as a continuous differential equation, the rate of change of bunnies, the rate of change of wolves. This is actually how you write down the lock of Volterra systems as a continuous system, but I'm showing you it evolving discreetly year to year to make it simpler. Okay? Um, this is actual data. I really, really love this plot. This is data from the Hudson's Bay Company, a trapping company, where they counted the number of pelts of furs bought and sold of snowshoe hares, bunnies, and Canada lynxes, their predator. And you can see, that, I mean, the, the Lock of Volterra model is not perfect, but you can absolutely see that there's this ebb and flow, this kind of oscillating, uh, this oscillating behavior of the bunny population and the lynx population in how many furs were, were trapped. And so I like this one right here. So you can see that you know, in this year, there were almost no predators. And so the bunny population skyrockets. Now, because there's so many bunnies, the predator population skyrockets. 
And because there's so many predators, they eat almost all of the bunnies almost to extinction. And then following, the predator population collapses because there's no bunnies. And then the whole process repeats itself. And it's not perfectly modeled by the Lockovol Volterra system, but it's pretty remarkable that such a simple mathematical system gives this behavior. Okay, so that's one way of curtailing exponential growth is through this kind of uh, multi-species interactions. Now I'll point out one way I like to plot this is not just wolves and bunnies versus time, but you can also plot the number of wolves versus the number of bunnies. And so again, we started off with 40 bunnies and five wolves. As you increase time, the number of bunnies increases, the number of bunnies increases and the number of wolves increases. Now there's too many wolves, so they eat a lot of the bunnies. Uh, but they're still growing. Now there's less bunnies, so the wolf population collapses, and the whole system goes around and around and around in this circle. This is called a limit cycle, or a periodic orbit, and essentially you go around and around year to year in this system, and eventually every point in the system gets, gets filled out. So I really like this way of plotting it. This is called a phase portrait sometimes, um, but really, really cool. Okay. Good, um, and the last example I'll talk about, and I'm gonna do a whole video on this, uh, how to model these systems, so I'm only gonna very briefly talk about it now, is the spread of infectious diseases. So this is uh, the coronavirus, and some of our simplest models are these SIR models, where you basically break, uh, these are called compartmental models, where you break your population down into a group of susceptible people. These are healthy people that can get sick, you have infected people, people that are currently sick, and you have recovered people, people who were sick but are now healthy again and can't get sick again. Now this is clearly an oversimplification. Sometimes recovered people can get sick again. Sometimes people get sick and die. We could add a D for death, um, but this is a simplified model called the SIR model. Uh, and again, it's governed by a very simple set of differential equations that someone wrote down. So the rate of change of my susceptible, infected, and recovered populations are given by these functions on the right. So there's some uh, transmission rate that's roughly proportional to how many susceptible and infected people there are. And there's a recovery rate uh, from infected to recovered. And with this very, very simple differential equation, if you start with a population, in this case, let's say it's a community of 500 people that are healthy, you can watch this progress in time through this dynamical system, and you can see that for short times, the amount of infected people does grow exponentially, okay? When you release a virus into a new population, it grows exponentially. But then as the population, as the susceptible population becomes infected at an exponential rate, this number decreases, and so the base of people who can get infected goes down, and your infection stops growing exponentially, and eventually curtails uh, as, as those infected people become recovered, okay? So even exponential infection growth eventually saturates and goes down. And here's another way I like to plot it. You've probably seen this before. So now the height of this blue column is how many uh, healthy susceptible people there are, the height of this red column are how many uh, infected people there are, and you can watch the system kind of evolve in time. Uh, same exact information, just plotted a different way. Okay, so, um, and of course these models are imperfect, um, but they can be useful. They can help us predict uh, kind of how things will evolve in time, what intervention strategies we need to uh, enact, and things like that. Okay, so exponential growth is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, but it only lasts for so long, and then natural processes cause this to curtail. And this brings up some really important philosophical or moral or societal questions about how we view exponential growth in our daily lives. So we've talked about how the uh, economy grows exponentially, the, the GDP grows exponentially, technology grows exponentially with Moore's Law. We've had an exponential growth in connectedness and our ability to explore and to travel, transportation uh, capabilities have grown exponentially in time. But all exponential things must end. So at some point, Moore's law will stop and our computers will stop growing bigger, faster perhaps. At some point, maybe the economy will stop growing exponentially. I don't know. That's something you know that worries people. 
Another concern is, you know, our uh, consumption of resources is growing exponentially. So that's an environmental concern about, you know, are we going to fill Earth with people and get denser and denser? And are we going to consume more and more resources until it becomes a problem, until the Earth itself is the feedback mechanism that corrects? Uh, and that's actually why I think a lot of us are so fascinated with space travel um, and kind of getting off of this planet and having more resources in the solar system and in the galaxy. I mean, it's science fiction, but we seem to be driven by this need to grow exponentially. So every time a new continent is discovered or a new country industrializes or a new resource is found, we gobble it up exponentially. And, you know, at least getting off of planet Earth gives us a little bit more uh, exponential growth. So anyway, I hope this has been kind of thought-provoking for you. Um, you know, exponential growth is, seems like a very simple topic, like, a, you know, an introductory topic in math. But there's a lot of depth uh, and a lot of kind of nuance to how exponential processes uh, can be used to model the real world. So I've really enjoyed putting this uh, lecture series together. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Uh, if you do, please like, please subscribe, uh, and hit the notification so you see when there's new videos out. All right, thank you.